Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle and challenger Richard Boykin face off in tonight's candidate forum. Our Spotlight Politics team on Darren Bailey's lead in the GOP primary race for governor. We're definitely going to see some economic pain ahead. Mortgage rates, credit card debt, and auto loans are all set to go up as the Federal Reserve takes on inflation. And a piano prodigy from Ukraine finds solace in music and in the community he found in Chicago. But first, some of today's top stories. Parents of infants, toddlers, and preschoolers are getting a bit closer to being able to vaccinate their little ones against COVID-19. Today, the Food and Drug Administration's vaccine advisors approved vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer for kids under five, agreeing that the benefits of the shots outweigh any risks. If both the FDA and CDC sign off, the shots could be available as soon as Monday or Tuesday of next week at hospitals, pharmacies, and doctor's offices. And the country's top COVID doctor has himself now tested positive. 81-year-old Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is vaccinated with two boosters, is said to be experiencing mild symptoms of COVID-19. A statement from the National Institutes of Health says Fauci has not been in close contact with President Joe Biden or other senior government officials. Fauci tested positive on a rapid antigen test and will return to work at the NIH when he tests negative. Congressman Sean Caston and his family shared a statement today following the death of his 17-year-old daughter, Gwen, who died Sunday night. In a letter released on social media, the Castons explained they had a family dinner Sunday night before Gwen went out with a few friends for a few hours. She came home, said goodnight to her parents, and didn't wake up Monday morning. The letter reads, quote, the only thing we know about her death is that it was peaceful. And the only lesson we can take from that is to savor the moments you have with your loved ones. We want purpose. We want to believe in a brighter tomorrow. But the only thing we can control is our present. Gwen was planning to begin her freshman year at the University of Vermont, where she would have studied environmental science. Her family says they're grateful for the thoughts and condolences they've received. A heat wave continues to grip parts of the Midwest and South, affecting nearly 100 million people from northern Florida to the Great Lakes. The National Weather Service maintained an excessive heat warning through tonight for most of Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio as temps pushed into the 90s again today. Meteorologists have been warning that the high temperatures could be deadly for some people, advising people to stay hydrated and indoors when possible. Relief is expected tomorrow for some areas with a high in Chicago tomorrow of, wait for it, 90 degrees. We wanted summer. We got it. Up next, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle and challenger Richard Boykin face off live in our candidate forum. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Tony Preckwinkle is seeking her fourth term as president of the Cook County Board. The board manages an $8 billion budget with a workforce of more than 23,000 people. The governing body helps fund Cook County Department of Corrections and the massive health system that includes a managed care Medicaid program for 400,000 Cook County residents. She's being challenged in the Democratic primary by former Cook County Commissioner Richard Boykin, a lawyer from Oak Park. And joining us are Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle and former Cook County Commissioner Richard Boykin. Welcome all of you, both of you, to uh, this forum here with Chicago tonight. Uh, President Preckwinkle, I want to start with the issue of violent crime. It is up in Chicago, but also in suburban Cook County. According to the Medical Examiner's Office, there were 675 total homicides, 2019, uh, all the way up to 1,087 in 2021. Obviously, the vast majority in the city of Chicago, but also in the suburbs, what more can be done at the county level to tackle this? Well, thank you for inviting us, Paris. I appreciate it. You know, this year we're going to invest $65 million in violence prevention programs. 
first of all, we're supporting community-based organizations that do this work, violence prevention, anti-recidivism, trying to keep people who've been in jail or prison from returning to jail or prison, and restorative justice work, trying to settle disputes within communities rather than involve the criminal justice system. We started doing this work in 2013. Previously, the county had only invested in the jail and the courts. That's been our legacy ob obligation in criminal justice. But when I came into office, I said, we've got to go, we've got to go upstream. You know, we're the recipients of folks who have been arrested and then need to be adjudicated. And we need to try to go into communities and, and do something about the pipeline into our criminal justice system. So I'm proud of the work that we've supported since 2013, and we're going to continue to, to support that work. Mr. Boykin, would you support these programs, and what would you do differently about violent crime? Well, thank you very much, Paris, for having me on. As I appear before you tonight, we have a public safety crisis and a public health crisis in Cook County, especially as it relates to gun violence, carjackings, retail thefts, and robberies. People are being terrorized in their neighborhoods. The county is responsible for two things primarily, public safety and public health. Uh, the current administration has failed to keep us safe. In fact, there was a Block Club Chicago report that came out that said that two-thirds of the people living in Cook County feel unsafe. When people feel unsafe, it begins to hit our budget bottom line. When the Chicago theater closes, restaurants close downtown, people are fearful to go downtown, it hits our sales tax, and that's how we fund our budget primarily. What I would do differently is I introduced a plan to keep us safe. I introduced that plan about three weeks ago. It is on my website at richardboykin4cookcounty.com. I would address the root causes of violence in a way that this current administration has not. It often says that the ruins of a nation begins with the homes of, in the homes of its people. We have single parents raising young children. We have grandparents raising kids. I would put investments in them. They're struggling to raise those kids. I would make sure we have mentoring programs. But then I would also stiffen the penalties for people caught carrying guns illegally. I would make sure that that happens. And I would also not allow people out with uh, gun charges on electronic monitoring. Uh, All right, I want to course. address some of those specific yes. aspects. But President Prankwinkle, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, and uh, Police Superintendent Brown have laid some of the blame uh, at Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox. She's your protege. You've backed her in her election, in her re-election. Mayor Lightfoot is saying uh, that uh, there's a soft on prosecution approach from her office. She was also criticized by the special prosecutor in the Jesse Smollett case for her handling of that. Does Kim Fox still have your confidence as state's attorney? Well, let's talk a little bit about how the laws get enforced in this country. They're enforced by local police officials, I mean, local police offices. It, to say that the county is responsible for law enforcement is, is a misrepresentation. We have like 500 police officers in the sheriff's department. They're, they're 10,000 or whatever it is, police officers in the city of Chicago. And most of our cities, towns, and villages have their own police forces. So law enforcement begins at the local level. They arrest people there, and then they come to the county, as I said, to be detained in jail if that's appropriate or to be... Um, or to, or to have their cases adjudicated. So, you know, I think we have to focus on local law enforcement. I mean, the, the big challenge in Chicago is, is the corrosive relationship between police and community. And that's a long-standing challenge in Chicago. We're, we're the wrongful conviction capital of the country. And when you don't have confidence between police and community, it's hard to get the cooperation you need to solve crimes. So we've got some real problems in Chicago around police-community relations. We've got a bigger problem in terms of investment in the neighborhoods that are the most violent. Because if you look at the map of Chicago, unemployed people, high levels of poverty, under-resourced schools, food deserts, it's the same map. It's the same communities. And what we have to do is focus our investment in the long term in those communities at the same time we're trying to do the community-based violence prevention work that I've talked about and the city of Chicago has to work on its relationships between the police and the community it, and not just point fingers at other actors. And that's what I was, is the mayor right to point uh, fingers at the state's attorney for a perceived soft uh, on prosecution approach? No, you know we've looked at the work that's been done since 2013 when we brought the actors in the public safety arena together, the state's attorney, the public defender, the sheriff, the chief judge, and the clerk. We begin work, we've begun that work in 2013, and we've, we've gotten uh, academic review from Loyola University uh, academics, 
about what's happened as a result of our reduced reliance on bail and uh, around electronic monitoring. And, and they've made it quite clear that neither of those things, a reduced reliance on, on electronic monitor, a reduced reliance on cash bail and, and our electronic monitoring efforts, they have not been responsible for the uptick in crime. What we've seen since 2020 is an uptick in crime. But after a very difficult year in 2016 and government and philanthropy working together to, in, to invest in violence prevention initiatives, we saw drops in murders and shootings in 2017, 2018, and 2019. And then in 2020, all across the country, there was an explosion of violence. And I think it's a result of the uncertainty, the academic, the economic collapse of the country, the people's fears about their health, um, all of that kind of unraveled our communities in, in a ways that, that led to more shootings and, and murders. And Mr. Boykin, you're calling for keeping more uh, folks in Cook County Jail, at least uh, violent alleged offenders. Uh, one of President Preckwinkle's priorities has been to reduce the population. It's gone from around 11,000 on any given day to between five and 6,000 in the Cook County Jail. If you keep more offenders in there, aren't you violating uh, civil rights for people that are not guilty of a crime yet? Well, let me say this first of all. When I was elected in 2014 as a county commissioner, I asked Sheriff Tom Dart, can you police in Chicago? He says, absolutely. My charter allows me to make arrests in Chicago. It allows me to do policing. He said, I have to be invited in. And so what I did is I then reached out to the assistant superintendent of police, and I set up a meeting with Sheriff Dart and that person at MacArthur's restaurant on the west side of Chicago. And then we got a sheriff's command center in Austin where they're actually doing policing alongside of the, the Chicago Police Department. Now, of course, the sheriff is in River North as well to help police up there with some of the crimes, some of the carjackings. So to suggest somehow that uh, gun violence and carjackings, all of that falls on local officials is a misnomer, and it's wrong. The number one responsibility of an elected official including the president of the county board, is to make sure that the people we represent are safe in their neighborhoods. Now, <clears throat> everything falls on safety. If you don't have safe neighborhoods, restaurants aren't going to come there. Businesses aren't going to come. And so you're going to have flight. Last year, we had 90,000 people leave Cook County, 90,000. Since, 20, uh, since 2013, there has been a mass exodus from Cook County. In fact, we've had nearly two million people is, is holding leave more Cook County. alleged offenders in jail the answer here? So uh, what the answer is, it's a holistic approach. So it's prevention, but it's also interdiction. It's also uh, making sure that people who are charged with gun violence offenses, that these individuals don't get out on electronic monitoring, even if it means that we got to hire more judges to speed up trials and that sort of thing. But these folks should not be out on the street. Let me tell you, when I introduced my public safety plan, there was a lady who stood with me. I had a number of mothers who had lost uh, children to violence. She lost her 15-year-old son. She said to me, she said, Commissioner, why did this happen? She says, I asked the assistant state's attorney, why was this guy out on electronic monitoring? He had a record of mile loan, and he was out on gun charges on electronic monitoring. She has not provided the budget to the sheriff, nor the state's attorney, nor the chief judge, so that they can watch these folks on electronic monitoring. The whole push has been criminal justice reform without making sure that people are safe in their neighborhoods. It makes absolutely no All sense right. whatsoever. You, you brought up a collaboration between the county and the city of Chicago. President Prenkwinkle, uh, what collaborative efforts uh, uh, have been undertaken between you and Mayor Lightfoot on this issue of crime? Well, we got a billion dollars from the federal government from the American Rescue Plan Act, and we have been working in collaboration with the city and the state. The city got $2 billion, and the state got $16 billion, to be sure that our investments are complementary and not overlapping. And that, uh, that work has been going on for six months. Now, let me just say, I mean, former Commissioner Boykin makes assertions. Two million people have left Cook County. That's ridiculous. There are 5.2 million people in Cook County. How does he think two million people have left? I mean, you can't just make up facts. I'm sorry. It's right, not Two true. million people, that does sound a little outrageous. <laughs> two million people have, well, have the, not, the, the, have the not left numbers, Cook County. The latest numbers are a little bit over five million people here in Cook County. And two million have not left. Million. I mean, that's the whole... It, we used to be 5.2 million, the county. But two, that, 
5.2 million, that doesn't mean that 2 million people have left. Well, look, let, let people me just are say, let, Cook County. Yeah, well, let's stipulate, though, that 2 million number, that would, that would be 40% of the county. That's, uh, that's not happening. That's not That's not true. And, and let Cook me just County. say, I, I, I refuse to believe that people are going to suggest that it's the sole responsibility of the president of Cook County, the economic and social factors that choose make people choose to live in one place or another. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, I've tried over the last 12 years to be a responsible steward of county government. We've worked hard to make the county fiscally responsible and put it on a firm financial footing. We've improved the quality of care that we deliver in our health care system and access to that care. And we have worked in, in criminal justice reform. And, you know, the people who have been um, released from the jail are people who are accused of low-level drug offenses, people who are accused of shoplifting, people who are accused of not paying their child support. The emphasis has been on those accused of nonviolent crimes who are not a danger to themselves or the community. And it's not the state's attorney that makes these decisions, by the way. It's the judges, and they do it on the basis of a risk assessment. Chief Judge Evans has instituted a risk assessment from a, a national provider that allows the judge to look at the charges that are that are made against the person, look at their record, and determine whether or not they can be released on bail, whether they should be on electronic monitoring, and whether they should be detained. And, and I should say, Chief Judge Evans has shared uh, data with us that shows that the rate of reoffense of those out on electronic uh, monitoring, according to his numbers, is not different now uh, than it has been in years past. But Mr. Boykin, uh, as, uh, as Cook County Board President, you'll have to work with Mayor Lightfoot, uh, at least for a few months, if she wins re-election for four years, what's your relationship with Mayor Lightfoot? So, if you heard the president of the county board, she says she just started working with her six months ago on the ARPA funding. What about since she's been in office the last three years? Why not work with the mayor of Chicago? I'm a bridge builder. I'll work with anybody. Look, our communities depend on us to solve these problems of violence, the problems of overtaxation. Now, what I will say is this. She's created an island of taxation in Cook County. We have the highest sales tax in the United States of America right here in Cook County. We have some of the highest property taxes. She's ignored the people in the Southland, northern suburban Cook County who are paying some of the highest property taxes. Uh, we have some of the highest gas taxes. We have the highest gas tax in the state of Illinois right here in Cook County. And I've asked her on May 24th, she actually approved herself a 10% pay increase and a 3% automatic bump every year without a vote. I've asked her to suspend, temporarily suspend the gas tax. She's right. refused to do and, it. And the gas tax amounts to, in Cook County, about six cents a gallon. Uh, President Preckle, with the inflation, high gas prices, is that a, a prudent approach to go, to suspend the county's portion of that gas tax? Plus the well, motor, fuel, motor, motor fuel taxes are the basis of our investments in infrastructure. And infrastructure is the foundation of your economy. You know, if you look at a country that's struggling or undeveloped, what does it have? It has poor roads. It doesn't have railroads. It doesn't have you know, airports. If we want a strong economy, we have to invest in our infrastructure. And the primary resource that we have for that in government is motor fuel taxes. And we use that across the county to invest in our infrastructure, invest in our roads and bridges, invest in public transit, invest in, in freight. So we use those resources, I think, responsibly to, to provide an, econo an economic foundation for um, economic growth. Now, let me just say, you know, the, he has said that we're not investing in the Southland. We've made the Southland a priority in my administration because we discovered that in the regions in the country that are the most economically vibrant have the least inequality. And in our region, in northeastern Illinois and in Cook County, we have tremendous inequality. And the part of the county that's struggling the most is the Southland. And so we have invested in the Southland in infrastructure. We've invested in affordable housing. We've invested in a an entity, the Southland Development Authority, to, to attract and retain businesses, and we've supported that financially. You know, we've made a priority lifting up the part of the county that is struggling the most, because we know that that will impact economic growth and uh, equity across the county. So I don't know. I don't know. So we're, we're talking <laughs> about Paris. suburbs like Paris. Dalton, yeah. Robbins, Harvey, so, South sure. Holland, so Phoenix. Paris. Phoenix. Phoenix, yeah. The those, those are the places that we've we've made tremendous investment of county resources. All right, so, uh, so Mr. Boykin, I, I have to ask you, though, you have appeared publicly as a campaign spokesperson for Willie Wilson and, and his I'll, mayoral I'll campaign. That. Can I answer okay, this first? Okay, very though. quickly, but I need Let to Let me answer to that. this quickly. So, she says that the foundation of the county is our infrastructure. 
I say the foundation of our county is the people. If you have no people because they're leaving, because you've made it an island of taxation, then what good is it to have the best infrastructure in the world and no people to use it? All right, so let me and ask so, you about your, your work for, for Mr. Wilson. Willie Wilson running for mayor. You've been his campaign spokesperson. Is that a paid position? Are you getting paid uh, to uh, help run his campaign while you're running your own campaign for Cook County Board President? Uh, so, yes, I consult for Dr. Willie Wilson, and I'm proud to do it. I think uh, what he's done, uh, nobody else in the country has done. He's given away $3.2 million worth of free gas and free food to people. And when you look at the thousands of people that are in line for free gas, you really begin to understand the need that's out there. I can't understand for the life of me why the county board president would approve herself a pay raise and not take care of the people of Cook County, not provide some relief to the people of Cook let, County. Let me also ask you, uh, the campaign records show that uh, Wilson's campaign has donated $25,000 to your campaign. Sure. Is, that, is that considered payment for, for the work you're doing on, on his behalf? Absolutely not. So, I mean, Dr. Wilson knows that I support businesses. My values are, uh, look, I support the people of Cook County. I stood up for them when President Preckwinkle put the soda pop tax on them and uh, she voted for it. She was the deciding vote for that. I actually led the effort to repeal it and I was proud to do that. Uh, I stood up for the people and got rid of the tax on feminine hygiene products. I banned our law enforcement from choking people when they arrest them. I will stand up for law enforcement unlike she has. Two years ago they voted to defund the sheriff's police to the tune of nearly 5% of his budget. I will stand up for them that, and the, I'll collaborate. The pop with tax, them. that was that was quite a fight and that was re repealed as you mentioned. But uh, President Preckwinkle, you have, uh, you inherited when you came in uh, big budget deficits. They have shrunk. Uh, you've been lauded by uh, the Chicago Tribune for your, your stewardship of the budget. Uh, you've got a billion dollars now in this federal ARPA money that you're spreading out over three years. What is the budget deficit going to look like uh, in the coming fiscal year? Well, first of all, I'm very grateful for the endorsement of the Chicago Tribune and the Daily Herald. Um, unexpected, but I'm grateful for both of them. Uh, and they were really strong endorsements of the 12 years that I've spent in this job. My fiscal stewardship, my efforts to improve access and the quality of care we deliver in our public health system and the criminal justice reform efforts we've made. So, I, you know, they're, they're third party arbiters and, and uh, they have strongly supported me, so I'm grateful for that. What we're going to do with our billion dollars is invest in the kinds of things we've been investing in, infrastructure, affordable housing, social services. But there are three initiatives that I'm very proud of. One, we're going to invest more in behavioral health services. For 180 years, we've provided support for physical health, but we haven't had a very big footprint in behavioral health services. So we're going to create a department of, of behavioral health in our Cook County health system, do an asset inventory of resources in the county, and then try to figure out what role we need to play. We're going to invest in guaranteed income, and we, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. 3,250 families will have $500 a month in support for two years. And we're working with the University of Chicago, Chicago and other academic institutions to evaluate the success of the program. We're going to have a control group as well as our participants. Um, so I'm looking forward to the results of that. We've had good luck with that elsewhere in the country. And actually, Mayor Tubbs, who was mayor of Stockton when they had a similar pilot program, came to our announcement uh, in May. Uh, and the third thing we're going to work on is medical debt. You know, for ordinary working people, the biggest challenge they have that leads them into bankruptcy is, is medical bills they can't pay. So we're going to get ourselves involved in that and the health providers sell the debt to collection agencies for pennies on the dollar and we're going to intervene and, and try to help people pay their medical debt and restore their, their financial stability. All right, so you mentioned the guaranteed basic income program, kind of like the city of Chicago in Cook County, it'll be 3,250 people, $500 a month for two years. Uh, Mr. Boykin, is this a program that you would support? I think it's well intentioned, but I think um, it's it's going to have uh, a negative impact. And the reason why I say that is because we have a county of five million people. Uh, Thirteen percent of the five million people in the county live in poverty. There's three thousand two hundred and fifty individuals who will be lucky to get this. Is just a drop in the bucket in terms of an ocean of poverty, and. What I will say is this, is it doesn't require of these individuals to do anything, job training, financial, 
a counseling or anything. It just gives them $500 for a month for two years and then evaluates it on the back end. I think it's a, you know, uh, when, when you talk about equity and lifting people out of poverty, uh, it's, equity shouldn't be based on chance. So you're saying Everybody you might support something to, like this if there were stipulations like if that? There were, if there were stipulations, but these folks are in a lottery. And so people have to go in a lottery, and then you have to pick out the 3,250 right. people. You, you also mentioned you've, you've called uh, Cook County an island of taxation. Yes. W would you reduce sales taxes? And if so, how do you balance a budget that, that you know, has to have a budget deficit closed every year? Well, first of all, Paris, I think if we can reduce gun violence, which is costing us billions of dollars uh, in the county, every time we have a gunshot uh, case at Cook County Hospital, uh, at Stroger Hospital, it begins at about $55,000 a case. If you have someone shot in the back and uh, someone paralyzed, it could be a million dollar case. Every homicide that happens in Cook County, the Cook County Medical Examiner has to, pro has to conduct an autopsy. So county uh, resources are always involved whenever there's a shooting in Cook County or whenever there's a prosecution in Cook County. If we can reduce violence, uh, and make our neighborhood safe. We can grow our business base. Uh, we've lost since uh, 2012 uh, 12% of our manufacturing base in Cook County. In fact, I'm proud to have the support of the Illinois Manufacturers Association, and they said that they haven't heard from President Preckwinkle. Right. I would grow our, our business base. We'd get more people working in communities and we'd have more people paying taxes. I have to get to another issue that, uh, that is causing a lot of death in Cook County, and that's uh, opioid overdoses. According to the medical, medical examiner, a 1,900 overdose deaths in 2021 in the county due to uh, uh, opioids. Uh, what more can be done at the county level to address this? Well, I think this is another example of what I described earlier, kind of our communities fraying at the edges. It's not just the, the shootings and the murders, it's also overdoses. Um, last year we lost more than a thousand people, a little more than a thousand, I think it was a thousand and nine people to, to gun violence, but we lost 1,900 people to overdose deaths. And we in, in our health care system struggle to deal with addiction every day. Um, we provide support for people who are in crisis. And, you know, I, this is a real challenge for us, and I think we've got to deal with it in, in terms of the behavioral health services that I just talked about, because part of behavioral health is, is, is helping people with their substance abuse, with addiction issues. Um, this is a tremendous challenge for our health care system, partly because it's not just um, the usual op opioids, it's fentanyl now, right? And fentanyl is in everything. I mean, the, the street dealers put it in, in every, every kind of drug, the street drug that you might take. So we've got some real challenges around health care delivery, and I'm grateful to have a health and hospital system that, that provides support to folks. But that's why, well, one of the reasons why we intend to put a lot more money into behavioral health services, because we know that one of the behavioral health challenges is addiction. People take drugs to quiet the voices in their head or to deal with their anxiety. Um, and we've got to figure out how we can provide support for people so they don't turn to illicit drugs to deal with the, the mental challenges, the, the behavioral health challenges they face. Mr. Boykin, how can the county provide support to folks that are struggling with drug addiction and, and, and how can you bring down that, that number of overdose deaths, 1,900? Well, what we can do is begin to care about people. And quite frankly, we've turned our back on them. Uh, we haven't done enough in terms of mental health investments over the last 11 and a half years. This should have been done. I mean, people need help. People are seriously in trouble. And so what I would do is I would have outreach workers going into communities that have been devastated by gun violence, uh, high unemployment and poverty. I would have them knocking on those doors and telling them that the services that are available to them. And if the people had a stigma because of mental health and didn't want to come into a facility to get help, I would send the services to them. They deserve that. And what else I would do is I would have taken that 42 million that we're putting into the guaranteed basic income program and I would have put it into a youth jobs program targeted to youth who are out of school, out of work and out of hope. People from single parent homes, grandparents raising grandkids, I would have put our young people on a path to progress. 
and positive All activity. Right. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, my thanks to both of you, President Prankwickel, Richard Boykin. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And don't forget, you can check out our 2022 voter guide to hear more from these candidates and others on why they want your vote. It's at WTTW.com slash voter guide. And we're back with more Chicago tonight in just a moment. But first, a look at some of our upcoming candidate forums. Still to come on Chicago tonight, the Federal Reserve's determined to bring down inflation. Its tool, higher interest rates. Our Spotlight Politics team looks at what it means politically that Republican gubernatorial candidate Richard Irvin is pulling his ads downstate. And a piano prodigy from Ukraine finds solace in music and in the community he found in Chicago. But first, some more of today's top stories. A 19-year-old college student from Chicago was among the witnesses on Capitol Hill today, testifying about the impact of gun violence on America's young people. Gun violence is a multifaceted issue. We can point the finger at the folks holding the gun. We can blame it on single-parent households, and we can even blame it on lower-income neighborhoods. But until the legislative branch takes a stand to save our children, we are pointing the finger right back at you. Just over the past week, there has been at least 377 deaths and 804 injured from gun violence. Senators, consider yourselves responsible. Ernest Willingham is a rising junior at Northeastern University in Boston. He grew up in Cabrini Green and also on Chicago's West Side. He told the Senate Judiciary Committee about his experience with multiple family members and friends who've been shot, some of them killed. Senators and aides working on a bipartisan gun reform agreement hope that Congress can approve the measure before morning, the 4th Harrigan, of July recess. Chicago commuters will have access to more scooters starting tomorrow after a delayed citywide rollout. San Francisco-based company Spin is set to deploy about 500 scooters in the Lincoln Park, Lakeview, Wrigleyville, Lawndale, South Chicago, and East Side neighborhoods. The company says it may increase the size of its fleet later, depending on demand. Spin, along with electric scooter operators Lime and Super Pedestrian, were slated to receive city permits for this citywide expansion last month, but Spin says they've only recently received theirs. And as the average gallon of gas in Chicago tops $5.94 a gallon, help is flowing to some residents in the form of $150 gas cards. The city says the first 10,000 cards have been distributed or are awaiting pickup at City Hall. An additional 25,000 transit cards and 10,000 gas cards will be given away in the coming weeks. The giveaways are part of the city's $12.5 million transit relief program called Chicago Moves. The next round of recipients will be selected during a lottery set for the first week of July. Applications for the lottery will be accepted through September 1st. The COVID pandemic thrust the global economy into new territory. In the U.S. and elsewhere, the latest manifestation is high inflation. The Federal Reserve is taking action to combat that through raising interest rates. Amanda Venicky joins us now with more on what that could mean for consumers. Amanda. Yeah, Brandis, I know I have. Most of us have felt the impact of inflation, which last month hit 8.6 percent, higher than Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell says he and other governors on the reserve had expected. We at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down, and we're moving expeditiously to do so. We have both the tools we need and the resolve that it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. The key tool there, adjusting interest rates. The goal is to rein in inflation down to the eventual target back to 2%. So far from the 8.6 it is now, that could take years. Now, today, the Fed took aggressive action to begin to get to that point raising benchmark breaks three quarters of a percentage point. So up to a range of 1.5 to 1.75%. 
interest rates is one factor, not certainly the only factor, but one determinant about whether or not to go out and make a purchase, especially if it's a big purchase. So, you know, your borrowing costs depend upon what interest rate you're being charged. So when interest rates go up, it costs more to finance a purchase of a car or a flat screen TV, a big TV, if you have to borrow to, to purchase that item. Also talking about mortgage rates, the, when businesses take out loans to expand and so on. Now, director of Southern Illinois University's Department of Analytics, Finance and, Econo and Economics, that is department, Kevin Sylvester, says that the hope is that this will put downward pressure on inflation. They want to buy lots and lots and lots. Businesses will raise prices. But if people and businesses hold back on how much they want to buy, the hope is that prices then will, will drop. And so that's why the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. Now, today, Powell signaled that more interest rate hikes could be coming in the future. Over coming months, <clears throat> we will be looking for compelling evidence that inflation is moving down, consistent with inflation returning to 2%. We anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate. But there is potential for danger. As people cut back on how much they consume, as businesses cut back on how much they invest, it could lead to the R word, recession. Um, if the Federal Reserve is over aggressive, if overly aggressive, if they overdo it. As consumer sentiment continues to worsen because of high inflation, I think consumers are going to start cutting back, starting to try and protect their savings and being a little more conservative about how they spend that money. And so then Companies are going to be making less profits. Wages are going to then start to slow down. Unemployment will eventually start to tick up. DePaul University Professor Lamont Black worked as an economist for the Federal Reserve. Black says the feds have to take action on inflation to combat it. But in doing so, he says they may create the next recession. He says we are not there yet. Powell says the Fed is Powell today, but that is said that the Fed is not trying to induce a recession. He repeatedly signaled that he views the economy as robust and that there's a strong labor market with low unemployment and also economic activity even picked up despite that elevated inflation. But the economist Black says. GDP was down last time, and then new figures will be coming out next month. If GDP is down for a second time in a row, that would officially mark a recession. Black called today's action a generation-sized rate hike. He says economic pain is coming as folks will have to continue to pay more. People need to start battening down the hatches and thinking about you know, cutting back on some of that spending so they can build up a rainy day fund, you know, whether that's going to eventually affect their employment or whether it's going to affect their borrowing costs, you are going to experience more economic pain. And so the more you can prepare for that, the better. Black says there are a lot of factors that led to this point, the point where there is a crunch that is particularly impacting those who can least afford it. Now, some of the costs, COVID and its impact on supply chains. Also, the stimulus money the federal government pumped out to help cope with the economic impact of COVID. But then you also have these energy markets, gasoline prices really high, and that is impacted by external factors like the war in Ukraine. And those outside factors are ones that the Fed, the White House, can do little about. Now, Federal Reserve Chairman Powell signaled that there is a path to get out of this, but he says those external factors do make that path both more unpredictable and more challenging. Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And of course, we'll see you again in just a bit. Because up next, our Spotlight Politics team tackles the Republican gubernatorial race and much more. Stay with us. We've made it. Justice Jackson's appointment to the Supreme Court provides a beacon of hope. Black women are underrepresented. We still rise. We still show up for one another. It's us investing in the next generation and giving them something to enrich the next generation with.
How the very expensive primary race for governor is playing out in the polls with only 13 days left before Election Day. All that and much more in our Spotlight Politics. Joining us now are Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. Welcome back, gang. So, four polls have Darren Bailey. Four polls have Darren Bailey ahead of Richard Irvin in the governor's race. Uh, Amanda, what is not working for the Irvin campaign? I don't know really, frankly, at this point, what is working. I think there are a lot of factors here, Brandis. I, in part, there was a focus on crime when it seems Thank like, as we just up. talked about, the economy is really front and center in a lot of voters' minds. Also, there was an attempt to attack uh, by the Irvin campaign to attack his opponents, like Bailey, as being somehow anti-Trump, and that backfired and, in fact, really sort of emboldened Bailey and tied him further to Trump and sort of raised the ire of conservatives who are now really, it seems, going out for Bailey. I think there's also a sign that Ken Griffin, who was the primary funder of this campaign, is perhaps reading those tea leaves and those polls and is backing out. That's why we're seeing a changed ad strategy. And that leads to it, Brandis. Finally, really, we did not hear from or really interact all that much with Richard Irvin. He wasn't in hiding. He led those city council meetings in Aurora, but he was not out and about at least conducting interviews with voters. Really, it seems they wanted to, or with reporters, really, it seems they wanted to sort of avoid almost journalists and the press and hard questions and win solely on ads. And that didn't really resonate. And, and Heather, as Amanda just said, we know that Irvin has pulled his ads downstate. Does he still have a path to win with downstate voters? Well, he has left himself a very narrow path. Now, his path to the GOP nomination for governor was always going to run through Chicago and suburban Cook County and the collar counties. Now he's sort of put all of his eggs in his basket because if he's not campaigning downstate and if he's not airing ads downstate, he's essentially seeding those voters who might be persuadable to Darren Bailey or one of the other candidates in the race. And that is a high risk strategy because, of course, there are fewer Republican voters in Chicago and the Collar counties than there used to be. So, Amanda, you mentioned the money, of course. Uh, so let's talk about the return on investments for the billionaires in this primary. Uh, Paris, first billionaire Ken Griffin has spent $50 million about on Irvin. Is that right? Uh, that, that's about right. Uh, and uh, if, if these polls are correct and if they do hold, it's a terrible return on investment for Mr. Griffin. And I think a few other things happened here, too. I mean, th there were polls that showed Irvin in the lead in the very beginning, and I think they were up very quickly with ads trying to define him. I think there, there were a, a lot of uh, reports uh, from us here at WTTW and other journalists that sort of looked into his record and saw that a lot of his record and his background was very, very different uh, than the candidate that they were trying to put forth uh, to the public here. And that then kind of got weaponized because let's 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 be clear. I mean, he has spent a lot of money in this race, but then there's been a ton of money spent against him, attacking him, uh, not only by uh, a PAC associated with uh, Darren Bailey, funded by a billionaire, Richard Uline. There's millions of dollars there, kind of weaponizing some of this reporting uh, about his background. But then Governor Pritzker himself uh, has been very active in spending money in trying to defeat Irvin, and the Democratic Governors Association also has run ads. So it was very clear uh, that Governor Pritzker saw Irvin as his most formidable challenger and wants to face Bailey instead. Now, this has happened across the country uh, as a national Democratic strategy where Democrats have kind of helped, uh, you know, push along some of the more extreme uh, Republican, like in, uh, in Pennsylvania. But again, is that going to be the strategy that pays off in November if, if voters are going to the polls based on the economy and gas prices and inflation? So again, the polls are a snapshot in time. Uh, we have less than two weeks to go to the election, and we've learned a lot about polling in the last several years that it's not always accurate. Okay, so let's get to the county races, um, because we just saw the contenders for Cook County president face off uh, with Paris there. You know, Paris, is this Tony Preckwinkle's, is this her toughest race yet? They're well, both running ads, for example, or right, she is. She, she's running an ad, so I would assume, I don't know, I, don't, I have not seen any polling. I didn't ask them about uh, what the polling has shown them. But when you are the incumbent and you are running ads, uh, you're spending money and you're probably doing it because you do see some sort of threat. You can't just waltz into re-election. And as you saw in this forum, you know, uh, Boykin is uh, trying to take uh, the president on, uh, on the issue of crime and public safety. Uh, and uh, it kind of had her a little bit on the defensive on that, even though, you know, a lot of 
the, the issue of fighting crime falls to the municipalities in Cook County, Chicago Police Department, suburban police departments. But uh, so that is, a, a, I think Bo Boykin is uh, capitalizing on the fact that that might be a motivating factor for folks in the Democratic uh, primary here. And look what happened in San Francisco with the DA there and the competitive race in Los Angeles. So I don't know what the polling says, but usually if you're an incumbent and you're up on the air uh, with ads, you do sense some sort of threat. And Amanda, her challenger, of course, Richard Boykin, backed by wealthy philanthropist and businessman Willie Wilson. Uh, how is this fundraising playing out in the race? Well, so as you noted, uh, I think we heard there he is getting paid for doing consulting for Willie Wilson. But the numbers here are nothing like what they are, for example, in the governor's race where you have tens of millions of dollars being thrown around on all sides. Uh, I, I, last I checked, that was something like uh, Willie Wilson had contributed either through his campaign or himself about $160,000 to um, the Boykin campaign. And Boykin has is working with like half the amount of what Preckwinkle has in her funds. By the way, also, she has something else. She's not just the incumbent. She's also chair of the Democratic party of Cook County. And so that gives her a whole lot of leverage, both with connections, ads, door knocking, canvassing, the works. It's not just about money. And we should mention Boykin is running ads as well. Um, so let's talk about the sheriff's race uh, briefly. Uh, Heather Carmen Navarro Garcon was ousted from the race. Tell us quickly why, um, because hasn't she worked in that office for two decades? She has, but a new state law meet, says that the Cook County Sheriff has to be a certified law enforcement officer, and she has not. So after a, a long and winding legal status, she is off the ballot, but people will still see her name when they go to vote, but there will be signs posted that any votes casted, cast for her won't be counted. So a complicated issue, again, for voters. Okay, in the race for mayor, there is another official mayoral challenger, activist Jamal Green. Take a look at some of what he had to say last night here on Chicago Tonight. We got young people that are being shot each and every shot and killed each and every day. Uh, this city is in huge disarray, and we need someone, a leader who understands these neighborhoods, who understands the problems, but understands how to bring forth tangible solutions in a mass way. So, Amanda, there are now six candidates challenging Mayor Lightfoot. Would you say that the more who join the race, the more the anti-Lori Lightfoot vote is split? Yeah, Brandis, and I am not sure that it is going to stop at six. There could be further challengers for Lightfoot, but yes, that conventional wisdom, I think, is just partially common sense. The more other names are on the ballot, the more that that splits. There's still, of course, a long way to go in this race, however. So there will probably be more candidates. Uh, speaking of, Heather, uh, Judy Friedland filed paperwork for the mayoral race. Uh, remind us who she is. She was the longtime commissioner for the Department of Buildings. She was highly respected at City Hall and then retired uh, during the pandemic and has now been working as a consultant and apparently has aspirations for the fifth floor. Now, I should say that creating a campaign committee, which is what she's done, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to run for mayor, but it does. It is a step in that direction. I reached out to her campaign committee chair today and did not get a response. Okay, so there's also a bill under consideration where Commonwealth Edison would repay customers $38 million in that scandal tied to uh, former House Speaker Michael Madigan. Amanda, briefly tell us about that proposal. Yeah, so this is a proposal, not really a piece of legislation or anything. This is, however, a measure before the Illinois Commerce Commission that would decide what that would mean if it gets improved, which kind of it seems as if that's leaning to be the case. It'd be Customers would get about a $10 rebate on their bills. That is something that many consumer advocates, including the attorney general um, in Perg, are upset about. They say that that is nowhere near enough considering all the money that they believe ComEd has made through its, it, what it has admitted was trying to curry favor with former Speaker Madigan to get legislation that boosted its bottom line. Paris, you know, for what ComEd profits, is that a drop in the bucket? Well, I mean, there were multiple pieces of legislation here that hiked rates for consumers, and consumers uh, paid a lot of money over the years uh, uh, with those hiked rates. So, yeah, th I think this is going to amount to something like, uh, what, $5 a person? I, maybe good ten, for a, ten a household, but close. Ten a household, okay, so good for a cup of coffee or two cups of coffee or, or something like that. But, no, I don't think this is going to uh, quell the ire that perhaps consumers have uh, uh, directed toward ComEd. 
Okay, and, and very sad news uh, in the race for Congressman Sean Caston. His teenage daughter uh, died tragically earlier this week, just 17 years old. Uh, Heather, tell us what you know about he and how his challenger, uh, Marie Newman, have responded. Well, Marie Newman was very quick to offer her condolences to the family, and she immediately took down all of her ads that compared the two candidates directly, including one ad in which she took a direct aim at Congressman Kasten and basically used an expletive to describe his attacks on her and likened it to dog excrement. So that ad is no longer airing, and it has really muted what had been really one of the marquee congressional races in the Chicago area amid this terrible tragedy. Yes, such, such, such tragic news. Uh, that's what we'll have to leave uh, Spotlight Politics for tonight. Amanda Vinicky, Heather Sharoon, and Paris Schutz. Thanks, guys. Up next, a Ukrainian music prodigy who makes Chicago home. But first, a look at the weather. A local music prodigy began studying in his native Ukraine before he moved to Chicago with his family. The community of musicians he found here and music itself have helped sustain him during an uneasy time. Producer Mark Vitale recently brought us the story of an aspiring concert pianist with a lot on his mind and a lot of support. Here's another look. At Evanston's Nichols Concert Hall, a former church, a high school senior plays one of Prokofiev's war sonatas. I feel very impacted by the uh, Prokofiev's first movement sonata because it was written during the Second World War and uh, it really is very dramatic and powerful and uh, I can imagine, you know, tanks rolling in, rockets, bombs, it's just really overwhelming. 17-year-old Miroslav Mikhailenko is in the academy program of the Music Institute of Chicago an elite group of just 35 musicians among the nearly 2,000 students. Miroslav's a remarkably unique pianist as part of our academy program. One of the things that I think really draws people to great performers is the story behind the individual. I was born in Kiev, Ukraine, and I moved to the United States just four years ago with my family. All my memories from Ukraine are very dear to me. I think they really shaped me as a person, as an individual and a performer. The war has created a great deal of anxiety for me, knowing that first, my extended family is still in Ukraine, and second, that both of my uncles are actually serving right now in the Ukrainian military and defending my, um, my country. So we're praying for them. At the Music Institute, he's found support among his peers. To lift his spirits, the student orchestra performed Ukraine's national anthem with Miroslav on piano. That performance with the orchestra playing my national anthem, it really stirred me up to do even more for my Ukrainian community. And uh, I think it really healed me from you know, anxiety and worry that I, I had before. I think he's doing very well, and uh, I think the nice thing is there's a great community of Ukrainians here in the Chicago area, and he's gotten the support of that. Music is a great way to kind of help work your way through really tough and difficult times. I want my audience to be really captivated and captured by what I play. And uh, to be honest, my, one of my goals is to uh, make my audience uh, cry when they play a very emotional piece. So this would be my goal for the future. The war has really put a strain on me, uh, as well as my family and uh, all the Ukrainian people, all people around the world. We really hope that the war will end soon. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale.
Miroslav just graduated high school, and he recently found out he's been accepted into the prestigious Peabody Conservatory. There's more information on Miroslav and the Music Institute of Chicago on our website. Back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. After more than 20 years in office, Secretary of State Jesse White is stepping down. Tomorrow, we hear from the two Republican candidates vying for his seat. And revival in Fuller Park as residents start to move back in. We visit one of Chicago's smallest communities for our In Your Neighborhood series. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe and cool and hydrated and have a great evening. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a proud sponsor of diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused free continuing legal education for lawyers throughout the region.